I was in college, I coached high school basketball, and uh, it was halftime, and we're in the locker room, and I'm giving a pep talk at halftime, and uh, my best player says, hey, coach, your fly has been down the whole half. <laughs> and I look down, and I got dark dress pants and a tucked-in white shirt, and the white shirt is sticking out of my fly. <laughs> and I look at him, I said, whole half? Couldn't you have told me in the first quarter? <laughs> Sometimes people see things about us we would rather not see. Whether it's a shirt sticking out of my fly, or worse, my temper, or my selfishness, or my dark side. But there's other times we want people to see things about us. We want people to say, I saw the way you handled that situation. You were very kind. I saw your compassion there. That inspired me. I saw your patience. Has anyone ever come up to you and said, excuse me, but your faith is showing? The story today is about four men who brought their paralyzed friend to Jesus, and Jesus said to the four men, excuse me, your faith is showing. There are over five million Americans who are physically paralyzed. That's a big number, but I think a bigger number is the number of people like you and I who have been emotionally or relationally or spiritually paralyzed. Ever been there? I have. I've been paralyzed by fear, by worry, by grief, by shame, by doubt, by resentment. I've been paralyzed uh, by indecision. This miracle is about a man who was physically and spiritually paralyzed. And four men help him get to Jesus. And Jesus commends these four men for getting him to Jesus. And they, he says, gentlemen, excuse me, but your faith is showing. And their faith helped a man be restored. So as we've been doing a lot in this series, put yourself in the story. There's f different characters. There's the crowd. There's a paralyzed man. There's four guys. And then there's some religious leaders. Now, the last few weeks, we've talked about miracles where the religious leaders haven't been there, but they're back. And then there's Jesus. So there's a crowd, there's a paralyzed man, there's four guys, there's some religious leaders, and then there's Jesus. And Jesus is preaching and healing and attracting huge crowds. This is at the beginning of his ministry, so he's a rock star at this point, and then trouble starts because he becomes a threat to the religious leaders, and the first clash of many is about to happen in the story. Let me read you the story, and then we'll talk about it. It's found in Mark 2. When Jesus returned to Capernaum, the news of his arrival spread quickly through the city. And soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there wasn't room for a single person more, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to him. Four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a stretcher. They couldn't get to Jesus through the crowd, so they dug through the clay roof above his head and lowered the sick man on his stretcher right down in front of Jesus. Here's the key scripture today. When Jesus saw their faith, excuse me, your faith is showing, Jesus said to the sick man, son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the Jewish religious leaders said to themselves as they sat there, what? This is blasphemy. Does he think he is God? For only God can forgive sins. Jesus could read their minds. Careful, Jesus can read your mind. And he said to them at once, why does this bother you? I, the Messiah, have the authority on earth to forgive sins, but talk is cheap. Anybody could say that. So I'll prove it to you by healing this man. Then turning to the paralyzed man, he commanded, pick up your stretcher and go home, for you are healed. And the man jumped up, took the stretcher, pushed his way through the stunned onlookers. Then they praised God. We have never seen anything like this before. Jesus is back on his home turf, Capernaum, and huge crowds are gathered so there's no room in this house Jesus is teaching at. It's sold out, standing room only. Four men, four friends, four guys. We'll call them the foursome, fearsome foursome. They bring a friend for healing. Now, the friend in the story is unnamed, but I want to name him Keziah. I want to name him Keziah because Keziah is a Hebrew name for restoration. And he has been resto he he's restored physically and spiritually. So we're just going to call this guy Keziah. It's a, it's a common name 
Uh, it's a common Hebrew name, but I love the name. It's a restoration. So Keziah is paralyzed, and they can't get him to Jesus because of the crowd. And I'm sure they tried to get him to Jesus. Excuse me, paralyzed man coming through. Get out of the way. But unlike today, the handicapped were not honored. They were actually judged. Today, if somebody's coming in with a wheelchair, we do whatever we can to get them through. But back then, if you were handicapped, you were judged, as we've talked about. He sinned or his parents sinned. So these guys can't get through the crowd, but instead of giving up and going home, these guys huddle and get creative. They, they probably brainstorm, the four of them. Just picture the four of them. Hey, what do we do? I don't know. What do you think? I don't know. What should we do? Let's yell fire. <laughs> and the other guy says, I think that's illegal. And the other guy, I think that's only in movie theaters. And, it, it, and they go, no, that's probably not going to work. So one guy says, well, what if we smear some stuff on Keziah, make it look like he has leprosy, and we'll yell leper coming through. That'll clear him out. Then they look at Keziah, and he's like, guys, don't do that. I got enough problems of my own. And then one guy says, why don't we try the roof? We could dig a hole in the roof and lower Keziah down right in front of Jesus. And I'm not sure what Keziah thought of this, but I think he thought it was better than yelling fire or pretending to be a leper and I think his four friends were all high-fiving and doing chest bumps, and they're saying, cool idea, great. We might even get in the Bible with this idea. Now, Palestinian homes had flat roofs with stairs on the side of the house to reach it. A typical roof was constructed of poles set three feet apart. They would pack the space between the clay, then cover it with earth. In the spring, families would sit up on the, the cool grass. Uh, it, it, and, and so it wouldn't have been difficult to dig through the roof. So they haul Keziah up the stairs, lay him on the grass, and start digging. Imagine this scene. As the hole begins to open, those below are confused as dirt rains down on their heads. The homeowner's shouting, what are you doing to my roof? The religious leaders are upset because this is against protocol. And I think Jesus was smiling. He was smiling at faith. As he sees Keziah being lowered down, he shakes the dirt out of his hair, looks at Keziah laying on the stretcher. He looks up at the hole with the four guys. They must have been smiling with pride. We did it. We got him there. And when Jesus sees those excited faces, he sees more than that. He sees faith. Excuse me, gentlemen. Your faith is showing. I'm not sure if the man on the mat had faith. This is very important. I'm not sure if Keziah had faith. I mean, maybe he did. Maybe he didn't. I mean, he's an outcast. He's a reject. You couldn't blame him for running out of faith. I mean, he was ignored, judged. For, you, you couldn't blame him for not having hope. But Jesus sees the faith of four men who are willing to fight through a crowd to get to this man, Jesus. They've got a vision to get this man to Jesus. But vision without action is just a dream. Let me say that again. Vision without action is just a dream. I've always loved those words. Jesus saw their faith. It wasn't the faith of Keziah that, that healed him and forgave him. It was the faith of four friends. Let me explain the faith that Jesus saw in these four guys. We'll go through this real quickly. First of all, their faith was active, as I've said. Their faith was active. Jesus is back in town. He can heal Keziah. Let's get him to Jesus, they say. They believed that Jesus could heal their friend, so they got him to Jesus. Friends, faith is not just a set of beliefs. The devil believes. Faith is not just a set of beliefs. Faith is always results in action. It's action. What good is it, James Wright writes, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about the physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Faith is different than belief. Faith takes our belief and turns it into action. Faith, I believe, therefore I do. And Jesus looks at the action of these men and says, excuse me, your faith is showing. He saw their faith was active and it was persistent, right? It was persistent. As they walk, think about them walking through the streets for who knows how many blocks, for who knows how many miles they're carrying this guy, how many hills through dusty streets. But they refuse to take no for an answer. They see the crowd and they go, no, we've come too far. 
When the way was blocked, they looked for another way, and when they couldn't find one, they made a new way. They persisted and created the world's first skylight. Pretty cool. It's easy to say it's too hard. The obstacles are too big, right? It is. It's too hard to start a church during a pandemic. It's too hard to forgive. It's too hard to have a meeting to resolve a conflict. It's too hard. It's too hard. It's too hard. Miracles don't happen when we resign to the attitude, it's too hard. I guess it wasn't meant to be. No. Instead, the fearsome foursome persist. Keziah, we know that Jesus can heal you. We just have to figure out a way to get you to Jesus. And we're going to do whatever it takes. Even if some of our ideas are dumb, we're going to do our best. Jesus looks at the active, persistent faith of these four guys and says, your faith is showing, gentlemen. And their faith, number three, was creative. It was creative I love creative faith. When the way to Jesus was blocked, they looked for another way. When they couldn't find one, they made a new way through the roof. I love people with creative faith. People with creative faith. When they face an obstacle, they get creative, and they say, we're going to figure out a way to make this happen. Uh, First Fruit Farms, it's a business in Spokane, Washington, owned uh, by the Brihoti family. In 1984, people of deep faith, the Brihoti family, uh, they, they, they own a business, they pack apple, grow apples, cherries, and pears, pack them, and sell them. And they were convinced at that moment in 1984 that they needed to change their business model because of their faith, the problems facing their migrant workers. So first, so they got creative, they got creative. First, they needed sustainable work, so the Brihodis got creative and built a packing plant that resulted in year-round work for their employees. Then they learned that women working in the packing plant were leaving their small children locked up at home all day or pulling their older children out of school to watch the younger ones. So the Brihodis got creative and built an affordable daycare that today cares for hundreds of children. Next, they realized their workers needed affordable housing. Many were sleeping in cars and in garages or paying bloated rents. So guess what the Brihodis got? Creative and they invested over five million of their own money and opened Vista Hermosa, a community of affordable houses with its own elementary school, public library, chapel, laundry facilities, and grocery stores. And next, they realized that education was an issue, so the Brahotis got creative. And they created a foundation that provides scholarships for their employees or, or children to further their education, and they created a summer program called Camp Vista to help grade children, children, School children improve their skills, particularly in English. This was all, this was all because their faith was deep. And they said, we got to figure this out. It's going to be hard. We're going to put a lot of our money into this, but God is going to bless it. I love the name first fruit because that's what the Bible says for us to give to God, to the work of God, our first fruit, and God will bless the rest of the fruit. And if you talk to the Brahoti family, they say it's the best decisions they ever made to be creative. Anything worth doing, friends, is gonna be hard. Just remember that. We're gonna talk more about that next week. Anything worth doing is gonna be hard, so we're gonna have to have active, persistent, creative faith. I think about our partners, people, our partners that, we, we, that are out on the wall. I think about the Orangeville Food Bank, the World Relief, Growing Past Today, Clothes for Kids, the creativeness of those partnerships, the creativeness of those ministries, their faith is helping so many people. I just put this on the, on the screen. I, just, I read this this week, and I thought, wow, it's really true. The world we live in equally distributes talent, but does not equally distribute opportunity. This man... Paralyzed, He's precious, created in God's image for whatever reason. I don't know if he's paralyzed his whole life or what had happened, but he didn't have an opportunity to get to Jesus. On his own, he had no, no chance. So four guys used their faith to get him there. Their faith was active, persistent, creative, and last, their faith was unified. Think about this. Four guys had to agree on something. That's hard to do. You're in your car with four people. You can't agree on what to listen to, what music you want. It's hard when you get four people together, but they were unified. Think about the ideas they were coming up. How do we get this guy? Maybe we can go through the window. No, I don't like that. I, maybe I can text Peter, and Peter will come out and get us in there. No, that's not going to work. Let's bull rush the crowd. They probably had a lot of ideas, but finally they had to agree 
to even disagree, let's do the roof. No pouting. You see, when churches are unified, our faith goes and helps people. That's why Paul said, make me truly happy by loving each other and agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, working together with one heart and mind and purpose. Jesus, I love this story. Excuse me, gentlemen, your faith is showing. How? Well, it was active, persistent, creative, and unified. That's what Jesus saw when he looked up. And that's my prayer for this church. Now let's take another angle at this story because there's another part of this story. Because of their faith, Keziah, the man on the mat, was restored physically, but more importantly and interesting, he was restored spiritually. And it's an interesting order of miracles. A paralyzed man comes down, and he doesn't heal him physically first. He says, your sins are forgiven. Let's take another angle at this. Let's look at the man. Once the man is lowered down, Jesus confronts the injustice that this man has faced most of his life. Being disabled, the paralytic would have most likely lived in extreme poverty. There was no access to health care systems. He probably was a beggar dependent on family and friends. You could not be a whole member, a whole member of society when you were not physically whole. It was a sin issue to the culture. Unclean, you're not accepted, outcast. Most of the people Jesus healed were a part of these banned categories, right? Right? The blind, the lame, the lepers, sinners, outcasts, untouchables. You begin to see the heart of Jesus in the story. The paralytic's arrival is a dramatic intrusion to the religious leaders in the crowded room because this crippled intruder to the religious leaders is an outsider. But Jesus said, I'm here inviting outsiders, not insiders. An invitation to a changed life, changed inside and out. Jesus had good news to outsiders and bad news for insiders. Doctor's talking to his patient. He says, I have some bad news and some very bad news. Patient says, well, might as well give me the bad news first. The doctor says, the lab called with your test. They say you have 24 hours to live. 24 hours, the patient says. That's terrible. What could be worse? Well, I've been trying to reach you since yesterday. (laughs) Yeah. Boo, that's a bad one. (laughs) When Jesus came to earth, it was good news, bad news. It was good news for outsiders who didn't have a chance, who were not part of society. But it was bad news to the insiders because the insiders had created a religion with a crushing weight of man-made rules. The moral police insiders held the power and control saying who was in and who was out. I'm not even sure we realize how oppressive it was. Outsiders, the poor, the diseased, handicapped, slaves, women, the caste system of religion had left insiders feeling pretentiously secure and leaving outsiders hopeful for for some scraps of blessings at the back door of the temple. When Jesus was beginning his ministry, so beautiful, he walks into the temple and he pulls out a scroll and he could have picked any scroll, but he takes out Isaiah 61 and he reads it. The spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will will be set free, for the time of the Lord's favor has come. And along the way, he healed physical diseases, opened blind eyes, helped the lame walk, calmed raging seas. But at the end of the day, Jesus came to forgive sins. That's why he came, to set people free from their shame, regrets, failures. And this freaked out the insiders. Because their power came from a few thousand years of tradition. They were the ones in charge of determining who was in and who was out. What is Jesus doing, they say. This is blasphemy. Does he think he is God? For only God can forgive sins. So to prove he was God, he heals the man physically, restoring the man back into community. Just listen to those words. I have come to invite outsiders, not insiders. I've come. I've come to set people free from shame, regrets, failures. You may be watching this. You may be here today, and you wake up in the middle of the night sometimes, and you're still beating yourself up. Shame, regrets, failures. Let it go as far as the east is from the west. Jesus came to forgive us of our sins and set us free.
Like the tax collector, the pimp of the Bible, an outsider of his own doing, on his knees in the corner of the temple, beating his chest, crying out, God, have mercy on me, a sinner, while, this, while simultaneously a pious and insider religious leader stands at a distance, congratulating himself on his self-righteousness and has the audacity to point at the tax collector and say, I'm so glad I'm not like him. And Jesus says to the religious leader, it's a shame. It's a shame. You've got so much potential, but you're bound by pride. You might live a decent life, but you're never going to experience the gravity of grace. You're never going to experience the spectacular freedom of forgiveness. But you will live the rest of your life trying to keep rules you can't keep and judging people who can't keep them either. What a sad, dead life you'll live. And then Jesus looks at the pimp. I mean, he's pimped his own country out for money. And Jesus says, this man is going to experience a static eternal life because he understands, I came to invite outsiders, not insiders, an invitation to a changed life, changed inside and out. And if Vince was here today and he isn't, he would have said amen right at that point. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. The story makes me smile in a lot of different ways. Let me close with a story going full circle back to these four guys. The question on this story, in our story, is will our faith help someone heal? Will my faith help someone else receive a miracle? At the beginning of World War II, Hans Friedrich and his wife Enid escaped the war in Germany. They went to Canada, and he continued his life of teaching in seminary. Hans became one of the seminary's most beloved teachers. The students loved him because he was warm and gentle, and when he spoke, the scriptures came alive. His faith was deep, and it bled on to others. And Hans and Enid were very much in love, married 30-plus years. Every day they would take long walks around the campus holding hands, and the students were inspired by their love. Hans was a blessed man. He had his dream job, and his wife was his best friend. Then one day, Enid got sick, and soon she died. And Hans was struck with sorrow, devastated. For weeks, he would not eat. He would not leave his home. The seminary president, along with three other friends, visited him regularly, but he was deeply depressed. He would not make eye contact or even speak. He was experiencing maybe like some of us have, the dark night of the soul. On one of their visits, Hans spoke words to his friends with no eye contact. He says, I'm no longer able to pray to God. I can't pray to God anymore. I, I don't need you to keep coming over here. In fact, I I'm not even sure I have faith in God anymore. There was stunned silence in the room hearing those words from one of the most godly men at the university. Silence. Then the seminary president said, then, my friend, we will believe for you. We will worship for you. We will pray and intercede for you. We will have faith for you. So in the days ahead, the four men met daily for prayer. They made prayers and petitions on behalf of Hans. They interceded for Hans. They asked God to restore the gift of faith to their dear friend. And they continued from time to time to visit him. And after many months of doing this, the four men gathered in Hans' living room. And for the first time, Hans had a small smile on his face. And for the first time since his wife's death, he looked them in the eyes and he said, it is no longer necessary for you to have faith for me. It's no longer necessary to intercede for me. Today, you don't have to pray for me. Instead, I would like to pray with you, for God has restored my faith. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Friends, there are people, there are people out there, your neighbor, a family member, they're hurting so bad they can't, they, they can't muster up faith. They're broken, they're hurting, they're struggling, they've been judged, they're judging themselves, they've made mistakes, and it is hard for them to have hope. We are their hope, we are their faith, and when we pray for them and intercede for them and lift them up, friends, miracles happen, and your faith will bring a miracle to their life. All right, 
Let me wrap this up. Let's put ourselves back in the crowd real quick, and then we're going to sing a powerful song. If you see yourself, if you're watching or hearing, and you see, you know, I'm, I'm like that crowd. Just keep pressing into Jesus. Maybe you're a seeker. Maybe you just need to learn more and grow more. Just keep seeking the one who came for outsiders. Just keep pressing in. If you see yourself as the paralyzed man, like we all do from time to time, Jesus wants to take away your shame, your failures, your wounds, your judgment, your fears. He wants to invite you as an outsider in to a changed life inside and out. And if you see yourself, and I'm not pointing fingers or anything except to me, if you see yourself as time to time as a religious leader, just repent because it's no life to live. Don't be threatened by Jesus' invitation to outsiders. Realize we're all outsiders except his invitation to come in. And now I just want you to do this. Nobody will steal your wallet, but close your eyes right now, okay? Steal your, close your eyes and get real specific. Who around you is paralyzed in your life? Emotionally, spiritually, maybe relationally. They're hurting. They're hurting so bad they don't have faith. Who in your life right now is paralyzed and, they, and, and somebody needs to get them to Jesus? My prayer today is may we have faith for them. All right, you can open your eyes. Like these four men, friends, let our faith be active, persistent, creative, unified, and may our faith help someone get to Jesus so that we can hear the words that Jesus shared to those four men. Excuse me, gentlemen. Excuse me, my dear lady, your faith is showing.